Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Nausicast. The Nausicast is where we went through every movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and shared our analysis and research findings. Ever since we've concluded our journey at that time uh, of going through all of the movies, they actually went and made another one just to spite us. So here we are uh, giving our first impressions about The Boy and the Heron, directed by, written and directed by Hayao Miyazaki and released in the year 2023. Um, because the movie is really new and it's just hitting cinemas uh, internationally in some of the regions where we live. For example, the German cinematic uh, release was only a week ago. We are kind of structuring this episode differently from the ones we normally do, which are really well researched. And we cover all of the journal articles and interviews and documentaries and everything that kind of arose from the movies after their release as well, often like many years into the future after they've been released. Instead, this time, we uh, did pretty low amounts of research because we're planning to do a proper, full-style, deep-dive, uh, close-reading episode once more has come out for us to chew on, once the Blu-rays are out, that we can all, in our own time, watch the movie multiple times or as many times as appropriate so that we can give it a thorough coverage. But we still wanted to take this moment in time because usually we only get the opportunity to talk about Studio Ghibli films in a historical sense. We can contextualize them in the history of the studio we can historicize them and say what led to this what followed this and so on we don't even know about this movie yet because it is so brand new and we can finally talk something about it uh, we can finally talk about one of these movies in the present day present time you know what i mean and we're taking this opportunity to bring you a first impressions episode and without further ado let me introduce you to today's crew it is hipster cthulhu here I am, once again. Uh, he, him, of course. Uh, starting trend for the new year. Um, and yeah, I actually got to see this movie twice, uh, both subtitled versions. I got to see it at the, the BFI in London and then at the IMAX screen just down the road. So that was pretty good. Shout out to uh, Discord regular uh, Kiko Man, who saw it with me. Then we have Plate and Skull. Hello again. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. Uh, I have only had exactly one opportunity to even see the movie, and I took that, and it's still fresh in my mind. Uh, hot take right now. Uh, good movie. Go watch it. And we have Voice Flower. Hello, everyone. I'm Voice Flower. My pronouns are she, her, and... Um... I went to see this film seven times in theaters. <laughs> we were blessed um, with more opportunities than we were. <laughs> yeah, I was definitely uh, had more opportunities being uh, in the U.S. Uh, I saw it first on December 6th. And then the last time that I saw it was uh, just after New Year, I think. And um, I've seen it three times in the subtitled version and uh, four times in the English language version. Mm, okay, I've, uh, I've heard good things uh, about the yes, dub. Actually. I, yes. Oh, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. It, it's a great dub. Um, and, and we have me in the yard pronouns. Yes. He, him. I've seen the movie once uh, in late December before the actual German premiere in subtitled. Please go on about the dub. I just wanted to finish my introduction. <laughs> That's good. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I hear um, Robert Patterson goes uh, goblin mode. He... <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, he goes goblin mode. Um, that feels like uh, a role he, he... built for his fellow lighthouse keeper, Willem Dafoe. Well, Willem Dafoe was in this dub as well. Oh, okay. Who did he Yeah, voice? he plays the noble pelican. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, he plays the noble pelican. He gives he gives a really, like, I mean, that scene is is just so short. So that that that. Uh, I, I I mean, I did see um, I did see like someone on Letterboxd pointing out that uh, that this is the uh, the second movie in which uh, starring uh, Robert Pattinson and uh, Willem Dafoe, in which uh, the main character gets mad at a bird. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> God, I love the lighthouse. I haven't yeah. seen the lighthouse. Uh, good, good movie. Uh, you should watch it, as should all the listeners. Indeed. 
Um, also, wasn't this a uh, Ghibli release that was not done by Disney? I think a couple of the recent ones they haven't officially been done through Disney. At least it was G Kids over here. You see, uh, so they really, uh, they, well, they see, really. That's the, the sort farm of the, the research uh, we the expect for the full covers. episode much later. Oh, okay. I shouldn't have brought that up. Yeah, I that I said that. I'm no, it's all fine. <laughs> not exactly sure. I feel like I'm not. I feel like Disney was in charge of the the dub casting though i but i mean it's a really star-studded an, cast so like they there put is an some article forward, about it release. there is an article about the dub uh, on indiewire um which uh i read a long time ago and don't remember the exact details but uh okay well good we'll say yeah. that you you'll have to remember it for the next one Yes, yeah, I will well, remember yeah. it for the next uh, recording, yeah. Exactly. So, uh, as we usually do in our episodes, we uh, spend a lot of time talking about production and background and historicizing the film. None of that here. Let's just cut to the chase. What did you think about the movie, everybody? I thought it was good. It was a pretty good movie, after all. <laughs> I definitely did enjoy it a lot more the second time, because I think it's very clear, and like a lot of the audience uh, responses we've seen uh, out and around that this movie is so like Miyazaki's most abstract like it's at least wants to be understood like it, it it's it's not slapping you in the face with the message uh in all the way the others are and it's not willing to like sort of lend you the uh the obvious symbolism for a lot of parts of it there's a lot of things where characters just sort of like say things and we just take them at face value and we keep moving well, so I think once you watch it a second time, really digests a lot better. There's a lot more things to like look out for and latch on to. And uh, yeah, it's really strong. I don't know where I'd put it personally amongst Miyazaki's. It's too too close to tell. But uh, yeah. it, I think it's pretty good. I think it's a pretty, pretty interesting film for him to make at this point in his career. I definitely agree that it's probably his most abstract film because... I think the most obvious comparison point would be Spirited Away because it's about, you know, a young kid um, entering a mystical, magical world, learning something there and then returning to the real world. So very simply put, that is definitely a similarity they have. But while in Spirited Away, you actually had the sense that the magical world that you entered has its own rules. Like it, it's a workplace with a hierarchy and the characters in it have all have like fixed roles and everyone knows their place. I had the sense that in the world of this movie, um, instead we had like a loose collage of multiple areas with their own rules that seemed to constantly develop as we were exploring more of the universe and they were like sometimes really abstract fable like magical rules suddenly like oh no be careful of this this is very you know weird in this world don't do this and look there yeah. they are the spirits that are eating the big fish uh they are obviously the souls of the unborn children leaving this world to go to the next so it's like as we go, we just kind of discover this weird abstract world and therefore the symbolism mm. is a lot more confusing. But one other thing you yeah. said, Hipster, I don't quite align with because you said it's kind of like not slapping you across the face with its message. You know, I think Spirited Away, incidentally, is a lot more subtle about what it's about compared to How Do You Live, which is in a, the original titled after what it's about you know it's kind of very obvious by the end what it's about even though the way we get there is much more complicated and weird and abstract yeah the the initial oh, yeah, impression I there I, uh, I i agree with we, we were talking about it before recording that um it is the most fable like or like i think the technical word is a uh, fabulous oh, but yeah. uh <laughs> that's that has different connotations but yeah a fabulous picture no um but that's if 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 I like walked into this movie and someone told me that oh, this is like Miyazaki's take on some like obscure Japanese piece of folklore like that this little fairy tale about a heron and uh, and and this wizard, I would totally buy it. I would totally buy that. Okay, this is him taking an existing fable with a like fable like a folkloric structure, and mm. and expanding on it. But uh, but as as far as I know, it's it is like a a wholly like original uh, story. Well, aside yeah, from the fact um, that it started out like he was trying to adapt the book uh, "How Do You Live," which instead now shows up as a book that the main character reads and uh, and is moved by, and then the story continues. 
Yeah, yeah, from what I understand, that's what it is. Like, the book is completely, like, not influencing the plot in any way. It's sort of referenced. Right. I will say, though, on, on terms of influence, I would say it's not uh, unlikely that Miyazaki might have been influenced by Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane. Because I noticed this, and a couple of other people I talked to noticed this as well, in terms of just structure and the way that, the, like, things are sort of, like, the rules, like, the, the magical sort of nature of it. And we do know, in fact, that Miyazaki does read, like, Western, like, fantasy stuff, like, from authors like Neil Gaiman and Ursula Le Guin. Uh, so I wouldn't be entirely surprised if he read it, because it did get a big, like... Um, like a stage play adaptation, so it was a pretty popular mm -hmm. book for a yeah. good time. So yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if that was sort of a hint that's, hinted at. That's one game in novella that I haven't gotten around to. Um, Can you elaborate on the context a bit for like the the gay man uh, novel? Um, <laughs> the gay man, yeah. <laughs> the, the the book Ocean at the End of the Lane is about a boy who goes back to where he used to live as a child, uh, like an isolated farm. And he begins to remember this sort of magical adventure he had with the people who lived around him. And there's like this whole other world and these like strange things, these creatures coming through the other side. And then by the end of the, the story, he's sort of forgotten it again, or he sort of remembers it as an adult. It's this very sort of uh, strange, abstracted by time and like memory sort of fable that I feel like was at the end of the movie, the heron literally says, it's better to forget. Like he says, like you, 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 we all forget this in time, but it will still sort of stay with you. I feel like that was a very clear theme the two of them had. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, get, I get that. You, you, you also mentioned uh, Ursula Le Guin, and I, I will say, like, uh, uh, Tales from Earthsea, um, which I have read since we re recorded the episode on the, um, uh, on, on the Studio Ghibli adaptation, I think it's, it's a touchstone as well, because like you have this, mm. like, the, the 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 imagery of like uh, the small boat crossing through this like ocean uh, of magic but also this element of a magical world where the magic is like fading and and it's affecting like the society uh, that that's like in the area where the uh, the magic is fading um i, I, I and like the, the ships on the horizon and stuff i i got kind of like the ursula uh, sort of Gwyn vibes there as well me too I like that you said that. I like that you, um, and, um, yeah, the, uh, man, I, I know this is not the point, but I really just, I really just wish there was an earthsea, earthsea film by Hayao Miyazaki. He was trying to make it for like the longest time. Right? It was I one know. Of the he, wanted to do. he probably, he uh, probably couldn't, if he, if he could have made we, it, he would have made it. We Speaking already went of, through through yeah, the we, whole thing. Let's on not the, rehash on that it. Cast. No. Speaking of Earthy, have you all caught the the weird thing going on online that people claim this movie is about Miyazaki hating his son? Uh, I, I would say not say hate, caught it, but I, and it is yeah. bogus. Like that is just not at all what it's about. In if if anything, if you if anything of their relationship can be projected onto this film. Um, I, I think that the more likely uh, thing is that he, he's making peace with the fact that, uh, you know, Goro is not the uh, is not, you know, choosing to take on Studio Ghibli in, 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 in the way that like. Miyazaki sort of held the reins and like I, I think it's, it's if anything it's it's like making peace with the fact that there is no heir to Ghibli for Miyazaki yeah, yeah. oh can can we take I, like I, a step I back so too, it's and, not about hatred yeah so so maybe just uh, someone explain this weird online theory because I haven't actually read much about it I've just seen the the, the weird comments making jokes about it um Maybe someone explain where they're coming from, and then we can like take it apart by looking I can, at the uh, movie. I, I I can do my best here. Um, I I, I think it's um, I think that the the reading is like it's it's obviously like a, a hot take slash joke, like uh, baiting a lot of discussion on Twitter and Letterboxd and stuff. Um, but I think it comes from roughly the right place because this movie is like pretty concerned with like the um, the value of. Uh, imagination and art and what you take with you and what you leave behind 
Um, and if you if you see the uh, the uh, the great uncle character as Miyazaki himself, like with all like this legacy of creation and imagination, and the um, the main character, uh, what, what was his name again? Uh, Maito. Maito, yeah, Ma- Mahito, yeah. If you see him as like okay, Mahito. either like as as Goro or as like just any like the future generations and stuff that then his decision at the end of the movie not to continue this and the great uncle's like resignation and acceptance that okay this this is over this is gone uh i can see why people would come to the conclusion that oh this is miyasaki telling his son that it's okay for him just not to make movies uh i i get that where that's coming from um i disagree partly mo- mostly on the like how directly literal it is um yeah. and and how very like very much the uh the like auteur th- the, the the like bad version of auteur theory of like trying to understand the person explaining the person and their like the artist through the arts um and not the other way around uh i think an interesting way to take that as well is um I know I shouldn't be bringing up research here, um, breaking the rules, but uh, in, in an interview Suzuki did for Sight and Sound, he said that he read the movie entirely as um, Miyazaki being Mahito, because like Miyazaki said and before, we, we know this from the past, that he has had a hard time writing male characters, particularly because of how, like his sort of like critical views of masculinity as time's gone on and his, I guess, own self-image. And then with The Wind Rises, he was almost unambiguously uh, inspiration for the main character and connected to that. So in this, uh, Suzuki pitches the uh, mysterious grand uncle is uh, closer to being Isao Takahara mm. uh, as this sort of like, this this man who gave him this imagination to begin with, the one who sort of like brought him into animation and like he sort of crafted his whole like uh, career around. Also, f- just a funny part of the interview is uh, Suzuki claims that he was the inspiration for the heron, and when Miyazaki denied it, he says, I've worked with him for 40 <laughs> years, he cannot lie to me. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, that's that's lovely. funny. But I I, I think that um, Miyazaki is both characters. Uh, he, he's like, all of them. He wrote it. He wrote it. He, he, exactly. He's Every all of them. He's all of them. You know? Yeah, in a, in a way, and I, I do think that um, it it has also been stated um, in some interviews that I've read that like this this movie uh, the the passing of Isao Takahata happened during the production of this film and it according to Toshio Suzuki it undoubtedly had an effect on um, on Miyazaki as he was as he was writing it and you know uh, setting out to create this film. So, like, undoubtedly, like, there is some Isao Takahata to be found in in this film in terms of Miyazaki's relationship. But um, I think I think it is more broadly about uh, the the relationship of creators to the th- the art that they create and to the audiences that they reach. And um, to the people who would uh, sort of inherit their uh, vision. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I think. Yeah, I, th- I think the um, a re- really good place to start with approaching this movie is like the uh, the theme of grief. Uh, because like at the very beginning of the movie, we have this like stunning sequence where um, uh, Mahito uh, sees like the fire outside his window and goes running through the streets of, uh, of the like fire city being firebombed as uh, as his uh, uh, as as he fails to to reach his uh, his mother who who dies, um, and that like obviously frames the whole movie through this. Uh, through this lens of uh, this kid who has lost his mother and and is uh, grieving and is very like quiet and stoic, uh, especially in the in the first half of the movie. Yeah, and you and and you add to like and of course like the strange fantasy world. Like one of the like he goes into it because his aunt. So, so okay, 
correct me if, if I'm wrong, his father, af after his mother died, his father married the mother's sister. Yep. Who is at the start of, like, uh, when, when, when we, like, flash forward to, to them moving out to, to the house out in the countryside, um, she is, like, pregnant then with his half brother slash uh, cousin. Yes. Um, which is a, a big thing to swallow, but it, but it also gets us at this theme of like, you have, this thing is missing, this person is missing, this presence in your life is missing, where the grief is, and there's this attempt to replace, to, um, to fill that void. And the father has found like the perfect candidate to do that, obviously. Yeah, it's so... And there's conflict there. But there's there's definitely. Definitely. in the fantasy world, the mother oh, herself, but a younger version of her is like still quote unquote alive. And there is another place where you see this, the, the gap is filled and, and, and the person still remains in some way. Yeah, that's, I think, that's important true. to understand Mahito's origin point, right? Like one of the main reasons I think he's stoic and doesn't really connect to his aunt slash new, new mother, I guess, is because I think he resents his father for, you know, immediately ditching his mother, who he's still grieving, and immediately yeah. going for her sister. Whereas, yeah, honestly, it's we, we might, we share kind of Mojito's perspective on this, right? Like, we kind of see it from his eyes, and we also judge his father. But on, a, on another note, it is kind of like the central message of the movie to for Mahito to accept that his father has moved on and that he too needs to move on and keep living and cannot be stuck in grief and the past you know especially as the movie is framed by as you mentioned Platon by the firebombing that is the historical firebombing of Tokyo that happens uh, near the end of World War II um, and you know most of Tokyo burns down a scene that Miyazaki also covers in The Wind Rises and that's not by chance, it is because Miyazaki himself as a kid uh, lived at the time. And I think they and their family fled from Tokyo around the time or even before the city proper yeah, burned uh, com his down father, completely. His father also worked at, a, 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 at an airplane factory. Yeah. Oh, wow. so which, which is another parallel. Yeah, I want to, I want, I, can I focus on the, on, on Maito's relationship with his father and, and yeah. like also his, Shoichi is the name of his father. His, like, marrying uh, his deceased wife's younger sister is something that is, was fairly common um, in uh, East Asian cultures um, in the past as a sort of way to, uh, you know, keep it in the family kind of thing. Um, I that's think that's not common to say in, uh, that's... in the past as well. Sorry, I was just saying, because I've seen it in like old movies and stuff. I don't know. Yeah, no, what I'm saying is like, it's, it's more, it's a, it was yeah. certainly more common in the past. Um, and, but it, it's, it's very much from this, uh, a, a, a sort of patriarchal, um, uh, impetus um and uh like the film is definitely very critical of shoichi um not only as a patriarch but also as an imperialist and um there's lots to go in there but more importantly focusing on the grief um i i think that the the criticism the sort of thing that Shoichi doesn't like it is true that like by the end Maito also needs to move on and but the way that Shoichi has moved on is not the right way right because he's in in the way the way that he's moving on is at the expense of Maito and also um uh Oh wow! I cannot believe I just forgot his aunt's name. <laughs> um, it's okay. We forgot Natsuko. Too. Excuse me, Natsuko. Yeah, Natsuko. it's Natsuko. <laughs> so, and, because they're both grieving um, ma the loss of Mahito's mother, and Natsuko clearly has had a relationship with um, 
Hisako, or as she is known in the uh, the world of the tower, Himi. Um, and her, she also doesn't have power in the situation that she's been placed in. So if I get this right, you're reading Mahito's father as like a Holly negative character, because to be honest, watching it the first time and the only time that I've seen it, I mostly got the impression that we are framing his father in such a bad way because Mahito is hurt by this, but that because it's such a subjectively framed movie, we might reckon that there's a lot more perspective to this father figure. That That's at least how I approached it, right? Because by the yeah. end, he... By the very end, I don't think he's remains as an unsympathetic character. I think it's mostly no. that Mahito, by accepting his new mother, is also able to respect his father's decision. And yes, you're right, he's kind of like an imperialist in the sense that he supports the Japanese Empire, but Mahito does too, right? Like, there's this scene very early on where he... Uh, disembarks from the train, arriving in the rural town where he's gonna stay with his his aunt slash new mother, and like a, a military thing walks through town and they both bow in front of them. So that this is still during the war when I reckon most Japanese. It is. By the way, you know, there there's a moment in the film when Maito's sort of uh, uh, uniform is completely torn off and he's just left with his like like tank top. Um, so there's like this transformation from going from those sort of uh, imperialist attitudes that he has accepted from his father and and kind of discarding them um, in a in a metaphorical sense. I, I think that the film is not wholly negative on Shoichi. I just think that it is very critical of Shoichi's way of doing things and his attitudes um yeah like we get the uh, very comedic scene where he um puts on a, a samurai sword <laughs> like a katana and he's he marches out to fight and then he ends up just swinging it at a bunch of parakeets that fly into his face and shit on him yeah i feel like that scene very much demonstrates what uh miyazaki thinks of this sort of like very patriarchal sort of figure and the way that he's very self-important uh, I'm not sure what to make of him, though, because by the end of the movie, definitely uh, Mahito has accepted him. Like, we get the um, the scene where he's looking down the stairs at him coming home from a long day's work and kissing the stepmother, and he sort of feels isolated from that. And then the ending, literal, like, last two shots of the movie is him going down the stairs to sort of join them. So there is an obvious representation of the acceptance. I just feel like, I don't know, Soichi isn't, like, a very developed character concerning the the general movie he's sort of there as this sort of yeah the father figure who is distant by like definition like by his his place in the plot is to be distant almost yeah exactly he's, he's not a malicious or antagonistic figure he's just no. uh he's, he's, he's like at, at worst he's like uh clueless um and uh and, and not really like that effective of a caretaker but like from from what i remember of, of, of the movie he's mostly like uh, like very like protective and uh, and and stern and all, and all these like very fatherly things that just don't re aren't really what Mahito needs. In the yes, movie. exactly. Well, about the protectiveness. So after the scene, it's a very uh, shocking scene um, of Mahito self harming, and you know then he's treated. Shoichi barges in the room and is seemingly unconcerned with Mahito's condition or empathizing with him and, and just asks, who did this to you? I will, I will get vengeance for you. And Natsuko's like, you know, oh, Shoichi. And before she can even get a word in, he's like, no, I, I will find who did this to my own flesh and blood you know and it's just like it's very self-centered and you know uh he he sees it, it it really paints this picture that he sees Natsuko and Maito not as 
individuals, but as an extension of his own patriarchal, uh, like figure. Uh, yeah. Uh, also in that scene, a, a very nice little tidbit is he says, uh, I've already paid off the school, like how many yen to like, you know, get you out of it. And also I'm going to have like the teachers fired or whatever. He says some bullshit where it's like, you get a very clear idea that this is how he's approached almost all problems regarding his family. He's like, I want revenge first of all, and then I'm going to like pay whoever I need to in order to, uh, facilitate that. And that's sort of his view on life is just like, I can get through it. I can barge through it. In, that's sort of yeah. the, uh, the way. Well, I wish to touch back it, on the, the self-harm, though, I was like, because I do yeah. think that the scene where he hits himself with a rock is perhaps the most pivotal scene in the entire movie and is like possibly the impetus to all the events in the film. Um, yeah, it's, I would it's argue really there's one more pivotal, the, there's one more pivotal yeah. scene, which is when he reads the book that his mother gives him, but... Yeah, before yeah, no, we, that's true. Before we go deeper into that, just a brief question. Um, the father works as like in airplane parts, something. The cockpits that they are shown, or, the, or like the glass windows of the airplanes that they are shown to be bringing up to the uh, house in one uh, part of the movie, is, is that for the Zero? For, for the kamikaze planes from The Wind Rises? I believe so. Okay, yes, I... the reason why I think that, even though I'm not familiar with the design, is because um, they do have the uh, the uh, you you could tell on the on the 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 cockpit that the um, I forgot what the, the 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 sort of like divots are are flush, which was a a like new design that they used on the F zero. Uh, and it's they go into it in like uh, Miyazaki go, makes a point of that being like an important feature of the design in in like Wind Rises um, that like the 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 actual like things that are used to bolt the metal down into the glass are um, are flush and create less like uh, resistance. So, so I'm so pretty the sure that they're the F zero cock. Cock, uh, cockpit yeah interesting i'll i haven't thought about what that connection might mean but it's there <laughs> oh Absolutely. i i have an idea <laughs> yeah me so so i the well it, we are i guess we're focusing on a lot of, on shoichi but basically like he is kind of a person who has made profit off of the war and so, um, you know, at being the owner of a factory who is manufacturing these parts, like he's very like proud of the military, uh, especially the Japanese Air Force. There's a scene when he and Natsuko and Mahito are having breakfast together. And he's talking about how um, Saipan, which is a naval, was a naval base, was defeated but he's like totally unbothered by this. He's like, ha ha, yeah, the, uh, those those Navy boys, they're so silly. Uh, the, the Air Force will come in and do what they couldn't, you know? He has that attitude. Um, and Natsuko, you know, chimes in. She says, you know, she actually expresses empathy for the people who died, um, which, his, you know, Shoichi is seemingly completely unbothered by and uh you know there's just necessary sacrifices for you know japanese imperialism and uh all all, all during the while you know maito's quiet and listening um of course we know how the war ends we also know that at the end of the film which is which coincides with the end of the war they go back to tokyo so the implication here in my interpretation is um that they closed the factory like basically yeah. um this sort of manufacturing empire that shoichi was in charge of has been um you know closed because of the you know japanese losing the war and their military being um shut down 
So yeah, he has yeah. like this moment of of uh he he has his own arc that is kind of in the background. Interesting. Well, yeah, I see that. I, th- I think another thing it also um, it also connects with is this motif of modernity and uh, and like traditional like uh, Japanese history, which obviously is the thing that Miyazaki is quite familiar with, and we've become familiar with uh, throughout his, his movies. But even from the very beginning of the film, when uh, when Mahito and uh, and his dad uh, arrive in in the town, there's this moment where this you know a fancy modern car comes and picks up the dad while um while uh, he and his his new stepmom slash aunt are uh picked up in this uh I, I forget the name of what you call it with like a a guy like pull, pulling them um and oh, the, yeah, the very a ritual yeah and 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 the, and the very like big traditional japanese uh manner that uh, that they're moving into with this like dark and old wood all over the place uh, gets like later on as we're talking about here like sort of like like directly contrasted like sort of invaded by this like modernity and there's the smokestacks in the distance from the factory um and meanwhile like m- much of the story w- with the with the heron and all that uh it's it's very like very very old it's even older it's it's arrows mm. you know yeah and, exactly and, and feathers from natural birds and then you get into the tower and, and the magical world in there which is just has this much more like ancient and primordial feeling so that there's this moving through like through through time through through ages and this sense of like once again this this yearning but also like sort of sad nostalgia for a time that's about to end yeah i i agree with that um sort of historical look i mean i the interesting thing about the uh the sort of um like japanese uh, like almost like palace that their family is and uh but it, it when, when they when they come into when 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 natsuko leads mahito up the steps to to the the front door it's like completely empty it's like where where are all the people um and i i think that this is sort of like a way of 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 symbolizing the the emptiness of this you know uh sort of vision of a you know a way of the 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 way that sort of uh Japanese people were during the war were looking towards the past um as a way of you know, dreaming of a future of like restoring Japan to its rightful place, um, and the sort of emptiness in that. Um, I I don't know if I read it that way. I found the the treatment of the house that takes up the ho- first half of the movie to be sort of, um, I guess, more from Mahito's perspective. Like it's very like alienating. That like you said, the house is big and empty and old and feels strange like it reminded me a bit of uh, spirited away where she first goes into the bathhouse and it's this like completely uh weird environment all the creaky old wood all the uh like uh paintings from several centuries ago just feel like distant and like unrelated to the the child main character who you really yeah, doesn't also, have like a nostalgia the, or reverence for these sort of things all the elderly people who are like animated to like move a bit more weirdly and ha- a bit yeah more yeah I love, I love designs. the the old lady gang they're great and i do feel like yeah that is part of it their designs at first like the the first shot they're shown in is like almost ghoulish they're like these weird little gnomes attacking his luggage in this one big pile but then over the course of the movie their real their oddness their like off-puttingness becomes charming and they're literally there in um the weird russian doll form protecting him so like yeah, it's sort of like this this very creepy off putting thing that he's like not sure about. He's like very uncertain about his place in this sort of world he's been forced into after this traumatic event. It's, and it's sort of more him getting used to it. And I guess that's you know the metaphor that the movie also goes on for the large portion. Incidentally, yeah, because, as they know, hound we... uh, the luggage, it's because Shoichi has brought you know food. Uh, I think that's maybe another important part of his character that. He, with all his personal failures, he is definitely also taking care of people. 
Yeah. Yeah. And uh, no, that's but also true. Uh, if we, when, if we're talking about like weird off-putting characters that he grows familiar with, there's one pretty important one that's in the English title of the movie that we have barely even mentioned so far. Yeah. So true. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'll be heron. honest. I haven't mentioned the heron much because that's I think the biggest piece that I just can't figure out. Like. I guess we haven't all. I, gotten... I think I have a good read on it. That's... I think I okay. have my own interpretation well, here's, well, here's, too. Yeah, here's what I think. I think the heron is just a fun, weird, gremlin little guy that Miyazaki thought would be neat. Um. Well, no, <laughs> no, no, I, come on, no! You, you can't just pretty, do okay. that. <laughs> Well, well here's, here's a funny thing. I thought and this was a different type of episode. Like, uh, I'm sure we, we don't need deep readings. <laughs> just, yeah, just it came, it came from my, uh, my my interpretation of the heron came from the, the very quote I read where Suzuki thought he was the heron. Where that's not just like a fun thing of like them being buddies for the longest time, but the heron in what he brings to Mahito is a very interesting thing of like a sort of like he the heron is a, a bastard he like he purposely tricks mahito several times throughout the movie he fucks with him and he only ever really works with him for the most part when he does it out of necessity and like being forced to through this weird magical contract and like that i think it's it's been like sort of a thing that uh miyazaki himself has acknowledged that like suzuki like really likes to make money and he thinks about the studio as like this sort of uh, business and that's how he's been portrayed and he's even maybe admitted it himself and like Miyazaki knows that he sort of needs that sort of person like that that if you if you think you can sort of just go through life and everyone's going to be your friend and not try to maybe trick you or not try to maybe get one over on you for their advantage then that's sort of a a foolish thing I think that so much of this movie is about growing up and like having a character who is your friend ostensibly, like the heron does like him, but he also is kind of a bastard who will who will mess with you. And like you can't always assume the goodwill of people. You can't always go through life thinking that things will work out just because a guy said he would, you know. And that's sort of a bit of how I read the heron as a character. He's like a he's a moral he's a walking moral fable. We were talking about the heron and sort of like. Uh, you know, interpretation of, of his his role and his character, and I um, I think that the the Suzuki uh, stand-in is certainly. I think that there are aspects of De Heron that are inspired by Suzuki, and so you know, the, I'm not going to say that you know somebody who personally knows Miyazaki as well as Suzuki does um, it is not correct and say that. Heron is in part inspired by him, but I don't. I don't think that that's the main point of the Heron mm. as a character. To yeah, get to that, I think we really have to focus in on how the Heron relates to Maito, what his role is, and that is in 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 service of Mahito's journey of self in processing, you know, the death of his mother and his grief and coming to the decision to um, forgive himself because he has a lot of guilt about not being able to save his mother and, uh, and there's a lot of self-hatred in that. Um, and there's also, uh, you know, and, and, and he also kind of takes out his frustrations on Natsuko unjustifiably because in reality she's the only other character in this film who still like is also grieving uh Hisako his mother and that by the end of the film them choosing to them choosing each other as family even though they've been forced into this nucleus they, uh, by by their by Mahito's father, they still have the the choice to choose to love each other and to accept each other, and the heron plays his role in this by being the spirit guide, right? And he comes he 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 very much, in my opinion, is the embodiment of like a, an anthropomorphized uh, 
sort of avatar of nature itself. And Mahito's relationship with nature um, is a huge part of what helps to transform him. And he goes from the beginning of the film where he sees the heron as this like cruel, menacing, um, like sneering um, uh, creature that is just there to uh, mock him and press uh, all of his, you know, uh, scars or really open wounds. And it's over the course of the film, uh, his relationship to the heron is one where he sees the heron as, uh, as, as a friend, someone who has, has helped him to, uh, you know, make peace with himself. Yeah. Hipster. Uh, yeah, you, you've, you've kind of turned me around. I mean, I do still think the idea of the heron in terms of this sort of, we said the, like a, a narrative about, um, coming to terms with like life. I think that's part of the metaphor, the heron being this like trickster character that sort of uh, lets him like it that works with him but also against him and there's sort of like a, a learning to how to judge people i still think that does work but yeah now that you mentioned it there was one key thing that i remembered walking out of the movie the second time that i only just remember now and that i think it affects like the the sort of psychoanalysis of the movie a lot more is i think the heron is like you said he's this spirit guide and in a sense he is sort of a manifestation of mahito's self-hatred and a lot of his inner darker thoughts coming up to the surface and constantly assailing him like the heron is a an antagonist for the first part of the movie and if we remember correctly the heron only appears or no he, he doesn't appear the heron only starts talking to him after he bashes his head with the rock so therefore right. uh, once he's done this again this pivotal act uh the heron then like has this power over him because at first it's just sort of a strange bird that flies into the house one time being a bit creepy but then it suddenly starts talking and bothering him and it becomes like a manifestation of the guilt of not just his mother but also of this act he's done to himself, the, the guilt of his own self-harm and what that does to the people around him. So yeah, learning to like forgive himself and um, love himself is how he makes friends with the heron, yeah. Also, uh, pivotal, the first thing the heron does when he goes into the, the sort of magical realm is that the heron creates like this fake version of his mother made out of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like your uh, uh, the way that your mind like will like throw your worst things against you. Like he wanted to see his mother more than anything. And the, the heron's like, well, yeah, here she is. And it's like, she's completely fabricated. Like you're, you're making your own like trauma out of trying to like run away from grief almost. Yeah, also a actually, very fairy tale like thing to happen. Yeah. Yes, but the interesting thing is the ironic part about the heron making the illusion out of water is that his aunt is by nature almost an exact, like identical, you know, dead ringer for his mother. And so nature has provided this illusory like copy of his mother but it's not really his mother she's not his mother and yet by the end of the film she does become his mother and he lets go of his you know birth mother uh, and 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 accepts her her death and and accepts her uh, little sister as his new mother yard um what I found interesting was, okay, so we mentioned relationship to nature that Mahito has and that, <clears throat> how that is crucial for the relationship to the heron as well. And I thought it was prudent to mention that the relationship with the heron in the beginning starts when he first enters the house and as he is brought back to the back, back, back rooms. Don't, 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 don't do the meme on me. I don't mean those back rooms. You know what I mean. Uh, the heron starts flying at them and is already kind of like bothering him. So at the same time, we have mm -hmm. this extremely beautiful bird because it is a beautiful bird until the nose starts popping out of the beak. And well, that's the whole different piece then. But until that point, it's a really beautiful bird just living in this really idyllic pastoral countryside thing. And to me, the impression was the heron being actually an asshole from the beginning, you know, is kind of like a way to poison that, to kind of represent how he d 
doesn't identify with, he cannot feel at peace, or maybe even feels like this peaceful idyllic scene is fake to an extent, because yeah. for him it kind of has to be populated by something evil, something out to get him, something yeah. out to bother him, because, you know, the world is kind of shit and cruel, and maybe that kind of psychic um, hatred of the world, of himself, projects onto the environment and nature itself, yeah. because other yeah, than... it's sort of infringing yeah. on his you know, modern life. Because it's really different from uh, how Miyazaki and depicts nature normally. Because normally there would not be like a like an asshole bird that's actually out to get you, who's like coming to knock at your window even before he hit himself with the stone, I believe. Um, the, the heron is already bothering him um, and kind of like walking around on the rooftop above his room, stuff like that. There were many scenes where it was like actually like a, like a fucking horror movie where the heron is just mm. like, after him somehow, somehow cursed and dark and whatnot. Just so that yeah. my impression was that Mahito cannot enjoy the countryside and he cannot grant himself that that it is just that, right? Beautiful nature surrounding yeah. him now. Well, there's one thing in particular that bothers him is like the, the death that is in nature, right? Like when there's this particular scene that is like really discomforting when the heron goes and eats a fish and gulps it down oh that's and, true like the pelicans it's, it's also sort of frames right this later. sorry what the pelicans later also hungry hungry birds and the parakeets as the, well like, the pelicans are are there yeah the pelicans i think are there's there's more to it there because it's in like the tower world where everything is like more uh yeah. fantastical and you have like the water water but yeah, I'm sorry. I think I birds um, that eat other animals. Steps on That's planes. kind of like uh, yeah. what is no, seemingly I was, I was occurring just, here. I was I was just saying it's it, it, it it's like Miyazaki watched one too many Werner Herzog uh, documentaries and was just realized actually no nature is is cruel and filled with death actually. Yeah. Let's 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 make it <laughs> but you really can never watch too many Werner Herzog movies. I think though that the Werner sense. Herzog I think that's a good comparison because uh, the Werner Herzog. Um, like documentaries like that or nature documentaries are kind of are coming from this perspective of satirizing our modern perspective of like living a cushy, um, you know, indoors lifestyle separating us from nature. And I get the impression that that is the kind of like that, that is how my has grown up. I mean, we see him in his old house at the beginning of the movie when he runs out to, to, uh, try to save his mother during the fire bombings. Um, and like, he's just in a very urban area, you know, that's where he grew up. So it, it makes sense that he, f that he has this distrust of nature from, even from the outset, even before he um, starts to like almost uh, hallucinate um, some, some little man inside the heron. Right. But like, um, but yeah, I, I think that even though it's uh, kind of a joke played, but I, I I think you're getting at something that is crucial. Yeah, I, I think it's um, when we're talking about the, the the heron, we're really also getting at what uh, is like weird and unusual about this movie. Like we were talking about how it's somewhat ab abstract, and part of that is I think that it it feels like two wholly separate stories that are like overlapping. Where in the first like third or first half, we have this very down-to-earth um, story about a, a kid grieving his mother during the a very real war. And and then this, like, bit of magical realism, bit of, you know, fable comes in with the, the heron taunting him about that. And then we have a really sh sharp shift in tone with the heron turning out to just be this little weirdo guy who's just a bit of a bumbling idiot. And... The and and then we are transported into the world of the of the tower, uh, created by like his, his like great uncle, uh, like generations ago, uh, out of this like magical stuff, and and now we're on this like very much more like magical journey. It's, yeah, yeah. It's it, it's like if halfway through only yesterday, uh, it's like she somehow ended up in in the bathhouse of Spirited Away. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about that, and I feel like it's actually kind of key to understanding the movie. And maybe some people listening uh, don't still having trouble putting it together because the movie is very sort of 
not a like a one to one metaphor. It it plays around with reality and fiction, and Absolutely. the fantastical and the real so much, because I think it's a real important thing filmically to notice that like in Spirited Away, it's like a the her going into the magical world is a complete like direct line. She goes in, then she comes out, and we even say the only thing at the ending of Spiritual War, Spirited Away to even let you know that what the events happened might have been real and not imagined is her, her hairband, I think. That's the only thing that she can take away from this whole journey, is just one little thing. But in this, we actually cut back and forth in and out of the uh, real world and this fantasy world. Like, we see his father looking for him, he's gone missing, he interacts with the parakeets to come flying out of the tower. So, like, the tower is real it is a real space even if it is also this fantastical imagined one it's like it, mm-hmm. you know, it occupies both and they influence each other there's no like separation of another world that they then come out of absolutely i think that uh you know if we're if we're talking about miyazaki uh sort of being the the tower master and sort of this creator of this fantastical space i i, I think of it as very much his uh the worlds that he creates in his films as well as the the films uh other films at at studio ghibli um uh by by you know other directors and and how there there is reality in like informing those films it's not just pure escapist fantasy and the the fantasy that we experience that carries real you know uh human stakes um can can be taken with the viewer the 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 sort of um interloper into these fantastical world worlds and we you know and and then taken back into the real world there's a little piece that will be carried with us if we have chosen to to see um the the sort of real human um stakes within uh the 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 art right he literally takes a piece with him as well he literally steals one of the little uh, building blocks from that world and has it in his pocket out in the real world and the heron says oh you're kind of cheating there but uh he's like (laughs) because yeah that was the message at the end like you're supposed to forget the heron says it's better to forget all this but you will always carry that little piece with you, even if you know that the experience you just had was maybe entirely fictional. It, you will always take a piece of it with you. I feel like with this, we're moving to trying to put everything into more of a big picture view. And maybe that's that's appropriate at this time. Um, maybe just, you know, we could try and give like a general thesis about what it's doing and then maybe go back into diving into some themes more to support this to you know uh yeah my thesis i guess that i came away with the film definitely a lot clearer the second time is that uh voice you already explained it a lot i think feel Mm. um the the tower is sort of uh studio ghibli's films but also uh, even more widely i feel like fiction and fantasy and escapism and like how we divert from the world because uh the the world that uh is originally created the tower there's a line where it's like the the grand uncle who created it he read too many books (laughs) it was really funny (laughs) and then he like one day just like fell into one of his books he like literally surrounded his surrounded his entire life with fiction with escapism until he like it consumed him and he was like nowhere to be found in reality anymore which yeah. in a cruel uh, world might make sense, right? That you prefer yeah, the yeah, company like it, of like, me, to people. I think that's definitely a a point that Miyazaki very clearly understands the appeal of this, but is still desperately trying to say, that, like, in the end, it is all like uh, bullshit. Like, literally, the the how entire do you live? Universe, how do you live? You yeah. can't just escape. You have to go back to reality, and hopefully, you take what you've learned in fantasy uh, as as a spiritual journey, and and like that it enriches your soul yeah, but fundamentally so you can go the, out this fantasy world uh it's literally balanced on childish building blocks like literally uh, <laughs> stacking fucking jenga uh, to to maintain this magical world and uh, i think that's like the yeah the the fundamental metaphor there because um so much of the movie is about the the careful balance of these things 
It, it definitely is. I also... So so in this context, while we're talking about the building blocks, I, I actually completely agree with both of you uh, and everything that you've already said in terms of, you know, how the movie in general is to be understood. Uh, one addition more, because there's another big character that acts with the building blocks, and that's the Parakeet King. And my direct immediate takeaway of the Parakeet King coming and like slashing the building blocks apart because he, uh, he's, he's impatient or... Uh, uh, and angry that he couldn't assemble it real quickly. Um, I read the Parakeet King in general as like Japanese imperialism. Maybe that's that's leaning very far out the window, but that was my immediate thought. Like he's impatient, he's trying to build with these building blocks, but he cannot do it. He fucks it up and then angrily slashes out at them, kind of like a burning fucking empire that has ruined itself on its own narratives and its over eagerness to you know be the king, to be in control, everything. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that the yeah, idea yeah. of like narratives of that, that, that people like narratives, not just as like fiction, but also as uh, like so sociopolitical concepts is very much uh, something that Miyazaki is also commenting on here, that there are these sort of grand narratives of like, the of, of 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 a people and of a of a place within the world that are kind of like these same flimsy constructions of 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 fantasy that they're and yeah there there's more about the parakeet king and the parakeets that I could go into but I think hipster has something to say. Yeah uh I think these two things connect I sort of have two separate pieces that I feel really fit together. First of all with the parakeets the parakeets fundamentally I feel are uh, intentionally d d displayed in the movie as not malicious. Like they do kill and eat people, which is, you know, a not and good, elephants, not nice. And elephants. Yeah. But <laughs> That's a funny the thing line. is that they're like, they're simply portrayed as being like very like consumeristic, almost like they just reproduce and expand and take up space and they don't really have yeah. any sort of thought or malice behind them. They're sort of like, not, not like the stupid masses, but just like people who like, like are just they're born into the world and they they like they don't know what to do about it and they just sort of keep going on. That's like a lot of, uh, a lot of people. And the par parakeet king, he in his he is sort of very imperialist and like he's wanting to control this world because it is like a simplistic fantasy. It has like these magical rules and like things don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. It's a very simplistic world, but in attempting to possess that world and fully control it and like grasp it and like uh like have reign over all of it the parakeets controlling everything they do destroy it the parakeet king in his in his willfulness to seize control ends up destroying it because i feel like the fundamental thing with the movie that mahito learns and accepts is that you cannot have these like sort of perfect fantasy worlds because as uh, the grand uncle says it took him searching like millions of years to find 14 blocks of the universe 13. that exist 13 okay 13 without malice and then mahito says but i'm not without malice like i cannot exist without malice and like these negative things in my in my heart in my like soul and so like i cannot live in this perfect fake world because i don't belong in it because i'm real and i know that i have all this guilt and all these sins in my past that i have to live with and that is you know how do you live uh so i feel fundamentally that's where the two things comes apart and that the the tower world just collapses in on itself because once you introduce reality to the fantasy it does sort of like metastasize almost like you can't escape from the realities of the world almost yeah uh, just just thinking aloud here but like uh, with the way we've been talking about the parakeets here um maybe there's a reading where the parakeets are the audience but like the type yes. of like entitled fans who like want yes. like want everything to be perfect and when That's it, it isn't true. just yeah, right they, they lash out and I, also I when the when reading. the when the movie's over and they have to leave they become dumb little parakeets again they haven't just learned just anything they everything. haven't grown they just shit on everything and <laughs> yeah, no, um, no, but, um, but they they leave without without taking you know they they come into this world that is so full of philosophy and uh you know that that because it, even though yes it is fantasy they are treating it purely as escapism right the parakeets even though 
Also, Miyazaki, I think, is like making peace with the fact that, yeah, he has created things that even if they are intended to be sort of like this spiritual sustenance and like have these have like real philosophy in them that there he has made films that can be treated purely that that are treated purely as escapism by some people and he's kind of making peace with that he's he's the one who invited them into into his world he cannot fault them for uh for the way that they have interacted with it right yeah. And so I think, um, oh, but 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 the the parakeets as as hipster was saying are are this sort of consumerist way of 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 taking fantasy and film like and they you know but but once they leave the tower once they come back to the real world once those once that type of audience leaves the theater they they revert to how they were before Right. Just just back to mindless birds watching Watch Mojo top tens. <laughs> with their, their natural yeah. state. And not, yeah, not like or the Disney listeners movies. of the not like our listeners, uh, who are very intelligent, are can are carrying rocks <laughs> in all their pockets. I hope. <laughs> um and with that I think the next major element of like trying to put the whole film into perspective that we actually have touched on very little so far. I think the themes of motherhood and pregnancy, having children and so on, starting off with the, well, not starting off with like, but the first scene that left a major impression on me, and that is the scene with the pelicans and the little white soul beings. Voice what the water water, the water water, water unborn water. souls. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So they are kind of like these floating little uh, souls of children to be born in the real world that need to be protected yeah. as they leave, and the hungry, hungry pelicans, who, by the way have no malice as the pelican explains they were just thrust into this world with nothing else to eat so it's kind of like this idea of well what else are they supposed to do and interestingly yeah, we, are, we are pro-choice on this podcast th we are uh, uh, and and so is Himi uh, honestly because when she burns down the pelicans to protect the water water she also accidentally burns some water water so it's kind of like you gotta crack some eggs to make an omelette you know what I mean Bo, but, but in serious terms, I think that is definitely something interesting that's being depicted there because, as we know, Himi died, uh, the real mother of Maito died in a fire in a hospital. So we kind of have to imagine her as someone who, even though it was war and Tokyo was burning and so on, she was like busying herself, putting herself out there, risking her life, saving people, probably saving a lot of people. Uh, and dying in that hospital. And I think that has quite some sy symbolic importance that she died while saving people. That the idea is that, you know, some of the good people uh, will go out and live in a way where they endanger themselves, where they die for the sake of others and live for the sake of others. And uh, I think that ties deeply into what it says about motherhood. So not only is Himi shown yeah. in the magical world to be protecting those souls that will become children once, also as a character accompanying Mahito through this magical journey, she's consistently there to, you know, make sure he can return to the real world so that she can give birth to him at eventually. Like, kind of like, it's weird, it's mixed because of the time fuckery. But what my impression was that his mother reappears as a guide to bring him back to life and that his emergence from the tower is like a rebirth in the most literal sense related to his mother, as well as her yeah. deciding she needs to go to the real world to actually have him. Because as we know uh, from the story, his mother was also once trapped in this tower. And yeah. because of time shenanigans, they're both there as children. It, it's weird, Absolutely. but it's pretty pretty insightful about like what motherhood means. It means sacrifice, it means pain, it means living for the sake of someone else, and that it's necessary and valuable. I think that is a very common theme in the movie. Yeah, I, I think the um, uh, the the whole like motherhood and like fertility, for the lack of a better word, is 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 connected with the the tower world, which uh, as we've as I absolutely agree with all these takes that it's it's about uh, like escapism fantasy art uh, as as a separate thing from the real world but also as a thing influenced by it and and the thing that has happened in this tower world this crisis that um that the great uncle is getting mahito like lured into it to uh, to try to fix is that it, it has become this inert uh, dead infertile thing 
it is like even the like uh, even these unborn souls, which you know, uh, it, I, I think it, that's a bit of a beautiful sentiment that um, that people not yet born uh, begin as ideas, as as, as thoughts, as concepts. Um, mm-hmm. Like e- even they can't like go anywhere because the pelicans have nothing to eat because only uh, like an actual like human being of some sort is even able to get any like uh, any sustenance out of the place and uh, and we have all these parakeets who just consume endlessly and and even besides that the world the fantasy world is full of like it almost entirely filled with liminal space it's all like um like big seas between uh, b- between islands uh, with illusory ships at the horizon that don't go anywhere uh, it, it, it's all like stairways and tunnels and even like a, a, a maze, a, a garden maze that, that you have to get through. Um, and, and especially like the, the weird warrens you have to go through to get to the, the, the great uncle where he is. Um, but there's no real place to be, to live, to, uh, to, to be alive because it has lost touch with, with the real world in that way. So, so I think that is like the connection between the motherhood and the uh, like artistic creation things. Um, when it comes to the themes of motherhood, I also think there's, um, I guess the, the, our colleague the Thunder is in here, so I'll have to go for the uh, Oedipus Complex uh, analysis <laughs> in their place. <laughs> but um, the very first scene when uh, he meets... Uh, Natsuko. I've already forgotten it. Natsuko. Uh, it's it's like a very intimate one where like she they're sitting together in this carriage and she pulls him in real close and like forces her hand on her belly. This woman he's never met and there's this sort of like, um, I don't know, there's like this closeness, the way the camera really pulls in. And there's another scene just like it where she feels the um, bandage on the side of his head from harming himself. Oh, and man. like the uh, you hear, you literally hear the inner ear sounds of her fingers stroking his head. I was like, these things are like the intimacy that he's craving are also the things yes. that he fears the most. And like they, they sort of warp inside of him because it is Have this you... woman who is a stranger to him, but she yeah. does look apparently exactly like his mother. I also think it's interesting. They never show the mother properly in the movie. They only reference her. Um, yeah. But she yeah, looks that, just like his mother and she's, voice, yeah. she's trying to be um, intimate with him and he's just like rejecting it. Yeah. And that leads up to the, he's um, afraid the to let go. Channel. Of his... Yeah, he's afraid to let go, and he's also afraid of the new possibilities. Because I think it's a very common thing where yeah. stepchildren fear um, the newborn baby of the the, the step parents being sort of you know um, replacing them. Like yeah. I think there's that is their fear in the movie, and that's and the whole idea this... behind the the taboo of 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 Mahito being in the delivery room, which is a yeah the really... delivery room. Yeah, awesome that's a very scene. interesting thing. Because like there not only is... is that a... Oh yeah, go ahead. So I was just saying, not only is that a historical thing, interestingly enough, that like, at least in this country, and I think probably in America, I don't know about Japan, but like up until like the 60s, I want to say like men were literally banned from being in the delivery room. Like it was some sort of weird propriety thing. Uh, but uh, it's an interesting that that's like a historical thing of like you are not allowed in the delivery room. It is actually forbidden to be it, in the place where the baby comes from. Especially for this, Mahito. Uh, yeah, it, it's because, sort of this like, manifestation yeah. of his fear of the baby and the mother and this sort of, you know, yeah, not, not a body horror sense, that probably taking it too far, but like the idea of birth being this sort of, you know, almost strange thing that you don't quite know and you're not allowed to know about sort of makes it loom even larger. Well, according to... Uh, the, the delivery room scene is like such a important scene in the film because it's really the scene when Maito accepts Natsuko as his new mother, right? That's the first time that he calls her by that name. And also immediately after this scene is the first scene when we see um, Maito without his uniform anymore. That's So after he has accepted his new mother is when he is able to stop being at war with himself because that's what, in my opinion, that's what his like uniform sort of symbolizes him being at war with himself. But he's, he's not allowed in the, uh, the parakeet King is like very adamant that he, it was a huge taboo for him to be there because 
like as as Niard was saying, like the the parakeets being sort of like this imperialistic um, uh, entity. There there is this normative notion or a patriarchal sort of conception about the you know the the old heir wanting to snuff the life out of you know the new heir of of the family right so like to me that's the reason why it's so taboo for Maito to be there but that's not why he's there at all that's just like the normative conception under this sort of patriarchal system and another aspect to the the delivery room scene which is super important and ties back to a, a previous scene when Maito first arrives in the tower in the tower world he arrives on the shore next to this sort of outcropping of land um with this huge stone tomb uh like guarded by this golden gate it says those who seek my knowledge will die and then there's these like really tall pines behind it which is i'm pretty sure is just like an allusion to isle of the dead um the symbol is painting by uh Uh, thought that exactly yeah it's buckland right by um uh arnold buckland buckland yeah it's got an umlaut oh so i'm not sure how you say it yeah uh and which so like understanding that you know the and, and there's also like this idea that the stones even the stone building blocks are uh that you know the the tower master uses or the grand uncle you know is building it out of are are stones that are tombstones that are filled with malice um and oh also maito hits himself in the head with a stone so like the stone stones being like the carriers of malice and death um is like a a, a symbol throughout this film yeah. but the well, fact that also building, building blocks yeah but they are also building blocks yeah absolutely but the reason why natsuko it, like i don't know if you'll notice this but the the backdrop to natsuko's delivery room was the same um stone like the same entrance to a stone tomb that was on that isle of the dead when Maito first arrived. And yeah. my now, that's interpretation... That's the watch did seven times difference that right there. Yeah, that's that's the yeah, that's true. I noticed that the first time. My uh, my my up. take on this is that Natsuko, in her despair of basically being rejected by Maito and feeling this and, and feeling like she is merely a replacement for uh Shoichi she kind of loses the will to live and she is going to carry out her maternal duty by giving birth to a new heir and then but she 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 desires to die in childbirth um and uh that's my interpretation i know this uh, but the it, the fact that she's basically the delivery room is one with the tomb um is like very important to me and 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 so by maito choosing to accept natsuko as his mother and 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 love her it it kind of allows her to not feel so alone and so cast off this is fucking on point i was like wondering and this is another thing that i didn't make sense of why she went into the tower and i just couldn't figure it out but you're just like Blew my mind. Okay, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I think there's a very interesting choice in the movie to um, not show, like, a de- I guess you could say a domestic dispute between Mahito and his stepmother. Like, the idea that we could have scenes of them fighting and arguing, but instead we just get, like, one scene where his the maid tells him, oh, you, you should check in on her. She wants to see you. And he's, like, reluctantly sort of goes. And there's this, like, the idea that, like, the complete disconnect from her, like not even wanting to talk to her or see her at all, fosters so much like hatred and animosity between them than any sort of like argument shown on film could do. 
Absolutely. Like, it's falling into the place. pure rejection of their relationship. It's oh, falling into place like, where they're connecting apart. over that book too. Because she gave yes. him that book, right? How do you live? Question mark. And the insistence, Maito, go see her. Like every other character seems to realize they have some kind of connection that they need to figure out to help each other. And that's not happening. But like they both have this. Oh, this is good. Okay. Yeah. I got this movie and now. Also, I get it now. Finally. <laughs> I know, right? It's so good. <laughs> the um, We finally he, got him, folks. And and he really is indifferent to her. He 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 he's totally he doesn't really think about her well being. Um you know, Shoichi is also clueless, but he does he is thinking of her, but he doesn't really get her in the way that Mahito can, if only he chose to, right? But when she first like leaves her bedroom and goes into the woods towards the tower, he's like he like kind of notices it, but is like totally indifferent to it. He's just glancing up from like making his like arrow, his sort of masculine, um, you know, phallus of like how he's going to defeat his grief by punching it. <laughs> um, and he, it's it's not until, you know, he goes into the tower and, and realizes the pain that, that she is in and, and, and the loss that she has felt. And you're right. She is the one who who gives who who brings that book to Mahito to read while he is still recovering because it is a piece of Hisako that she holds dear and also which Hisako wanted Mahito to have this sort of shared you know it's it's the way that certain pieces of fiction and and this art can be shared between generations just as like you know i'm sure there are many listeners that we have and just many people out there who who share the works of of Hayao Miyazaki with their children as a way to give them sort of as a way to share these um this sort of spiritual sustenance because they they are filled with just amazing you know philosophy and and beauty and and truth you know that reflects reality so uh that that sort of connection um between generations by through fantasy um is is important yeah i, th I think another thing that that uh that connects to this is how um like Ma mahito's like journey is not just about like accepting the real world, but also uh, like uh, looking beyond hi himself and his his own uh, self loathing and guilt, and and seeing other people around him as as full people. Like, oh, uh, yeah. like of, of course, it's his stepmom, which is like the the big relationship. But I think that's also part of what's happening with uh, not only like meeting a younger version of his mom um, and and experiencing her that way. Um, like outside the context of her being this like uh, mother figure to him, but like being a peer, and also with uh, I think her, Kiriko was that her name? Yes, the, Kiriko. Uh, yeah, yeah the, the old lady who who follows him in. Like uh, up until that point, right. uh, as as we've already talked about, it, the the old folks in the in the mansion feel like weird to uh, to Mahito and and like to to the viewers initially. Yeah. But once we go into this fantasy world and see this like young and uh, really cool version of Strong, this like, old lady, and also caring, yeah, yeah. and and also like androgynous in an in, in interesting uh, way. I, I don't know if it like it's different in the dub and and the sub, like how how the voice presents. Um, oh, but and, just the, uh, the, the very very ma masculine like. Yes, Coded definitely. The, the, it's the in it's she, in yeah, both it's versions. Important. There's, I think that's yeah. definitely uh, intentional. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what I want to say. I just want to mention that. But, um, <laughs> but 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 these uh, two examples with the the young version of the mother and uh, and of Kiriko, uh, that gets also at like okay, this is a like fantasy world, and part of like the cool thing about like a fantasy is uh, and imagination is this. Uh, imagining others in other contexts and understanding others through in in a different way, 
and uh, and even like yeah. the the uh, even like uh, Himi's um, like her magical like she's a pyromancer in in this magical world, and mm-hmm. uh, and and that's like clearly like a way of like it sort of reclaims the like uh, like her, her her death through firebombing uh, into something that's that that gives her power in in this world yeah um which which has this like extra layer of like weirdness because um i don't think the great uncle would know that that happened so so it feels more like a mahito's psychology get like affecting the the, the world in that way um but it's it's well, interesting anyway it is there's there's one key like or there's there's one line that she throws out at the end when they're having their like you know their last goodbye and they're they're gonna go through the different their two separate doors into their own times um you know mahito is still insistent like no you you can't go back like you're gonna die in the fire and she's like i'm not afraid of fire (laughs) like i feel like there is like the fact that she is a pyromancer certainly could be because of mahito's conception but it also could be out of the child Himi's own imagination. Um, and I think that that is the thing that, you know, why she's a child in in the tower is, uh, the way I interpret it is, I, I imagine that that's the age she was when she, like, was reading these books that her granduncle was giving her, including mm-hmm. How Do You Live, the one that she bequeaths to Mahito, and so, you know, they the reason why they're also like peers and are the same age is because it when in 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 the way that we interact with art, like everybody is a peer, right? Like, so, uh, I guess the what I was trying to get at is that you know it could be that she always was kind of fascinated by fire and. And had this imagination about fire, and the fact that she died in a fire isn't any more, isn't any more or less like scary than the thought of death, in an abstract sense, right? So, I, I think that that's the the point that Miyazaki is making there is that it's dying in a fire isn't particularly, like, uh, you know, uh. It, the way that he, he, he doesn't think that she's like, that it's particularly like, like scary any more so than just death itself, but that death is part of life and it's not preventable. Yeah. I, I think there's two, like two greater level readings uh, on, on, on the, like Himi as a character. Uh-huh. There's, there's one, which I think Yard has already alluded to this, um, this sort of like wibbly wobbly timey wimey time travel reading where like oh she went into the tower when she was this age or like metaphorically like she was as you mentioned voice like absorbed by 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 this fantasy at this age and so he is interacting with a young version of her who will leave in the past and forget it and then and and then move on and in that reading like Himi is a is a much more active character and that and that becomes part of it I, I don't really agree with that reading I think um, I I think what is happening in the in the tower is largely like the the like the fantasy and the imagination of uh, of Mahito and his uh, his great uncle like both influencing each other and that well reading, I think it's both the character of Himi isn't yeah it, it's it's complicated of course but I think that the that 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 line uh, about like oh uh, like I uh, I'm not scared of fire I think that is more a comfort to uh, Mahito and, and and as such is part of I how, agree. I agree how with that. art can comfort you and can maintain a sort of memory of the people you have lost and and can help you process grief in that way um and but, as, as one of the like good parts of, of that weird fantasy world that's true but I will also want to point out the scene when uh the other like uh auntie is talking to Shoichi about the tower and and when it like how it was like came down from the heavens as this meteor and and then there later had this tower built around it by the grand uncle she also says that in reality like himi 
disappeared for like a year into that tower. So what we can think about that is like, okay, well, if, if they're like, maybe she really did like go like spend a year of her life just in books that her grand uncle was giving her. What caused her to come out of that tower though, right? And I think that just how Mahito leaves the tower and chooses to go back to reality to accept Natsuko and live with Natsuko as his new mother um, and to and to sort of face the world and, and not lash out at it and face himself. Um, we, we can see that in the past, his mother also went through a similar journey of, you know, wanting to escape into these books but then eventually deciding, no, I'm, I'm actually going to live my life. I, I want to go, you know, I want to, I want to have a child, um, you know? And so I, I think that the way that they interact in sort of from Mahito's perspective is definitely more about his own conception and his own dealing with the grief. But I think that there is this, this idea that the way that, anybody interacts with fantasy can become escapist until the moment that you choose to bring it back into reality. And there, there's this, um, basically, uh, there's this sense that his mother did that in the past. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I didn't mean to put it as like a binary and one of them is true and one of them isn't, uh, it, it, it clearly has all these layers and all these readings that like interact with each other it's mm -hmm. the, part of what makes it so fable like is this ambiguity and the and uncertainty and magic to it um the way i I'd, I'd see it is yeah it kind of it kind of applies both ways because essentially yeah her uh, saying fire doesn't scare me is both sort of meant to be a comfort for him but also again it's a it's a general representation of what that both their journeys is is where it's like the fire powers she had and what he learned in the tower allows them both to go back to their lives, you know, not being afraid of what they know is coming and just sort of like knowing how to, you know, how how to live with it uh, yeah. and like having accepted it. Because ultimately, yeah, like what he learns and this most important part of it is that he can finally forgive himself for thinking that he let his mother die, for thinking if only I'd got to the hospital before the fire, I could have saved her. And she's like, no. Like, I want to go back in time and live my life the exact same way up until now so that you can be born. As, like, you need to accept that, like, your mother loves you more than you think you could have saved her, you know? Like, she's willing to die in that fire if she knows that you turn out okay like this. And that's sort of what he has to uh, eventually learn with that. Yeah, it's it's back, it's it's grief, uh, again, mm -hmm. that runs through the whole uh, whole story. I just I do want to mention something that I we've, we've sort of been touching on it, but but this movie has like a, a lot of like thing with the elements. Like before, we talked about how like earth and stone has this like this sense of like being cursed, being doomed, but also being like building blocks in some way, things you take with you, things that are permanent. Um, and we and then then we have like the fire, which is obviously like you, we both have the trauma and the death, but also this like um, the violence, like. Re yeah, the, the, and but also this like this magic, this reclamation, this like wonder to it mm -hmm. that, uh, that that gets added once you're in the tower. Uh, water is a is a really really big one, which is Definitely. directly associated with the tower world, with fantasy, with with escape, but also with like being stuck because it's it's like a swampy area they're at, and there's even the the part where like the tower got like completely flooded at one point. Yeah. Um, in in the past, so like water is like a really big like through line there, and I think also like wood is is also important. I think Mahito mentions that like uh, <laughs> late in the movie with this just complete nonsense fairy tale logic, being like ah oh, stone blocks that, that that's like cursed tombstone. You should make them out of wood. That would be smarter. And it's like, oh yeah, that that's actually completely true. And I'm sitting there like, wow, th this kid knows, uh, understands this world uh, in a way that wasn't explained to me. But I, uh, I digress. Um, well, I, I wood, wood is kind of like nature, right? It's it's pure in its sort I, of. I disagree. I think in in this, it's uh, uh, wood is mostly represented through human tools, like the way he makes the uh, well, it's makes transformative. The bow and arrow and, uh, 
Yeah, it, 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 it is transfer. Uh, it has both base. sides, yeah. right? All of the elements have like this sort of both um, uh, positive and negative sides. But obviously, I don't want to. That's not as a as a like a as a. Uh, that's not. A, I'm not using those terms for in a way of judgment, but like that there is sort of this uh, both destructive and like creative sides to to mm. all the elements yeah my last idea would be that metal could be one of them like in the, like that, that's one of the like classical like chinese uh, elements metal is one of them i think mm -hmm. i think um, it's gold specifically i don't know why yeah. but or yeah. metal yeah, yeah but, very yeah, but, but, but it that depends. would be more like the, the the katana the uh the airplane parts the uh the, the knife that kiriko uses to yeah. uh, the arrowhead to, made to out of a nail yeah, yeah, like the which is like much more like, uh, which are all like weapons and like f from human technology, which is yes. interesting. Sort of modernity. It, it, and there's an also things I noticed. there's also air. There's there's oh, yeah. there's flight. I forgot. Which is like sort of this, and 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 there's you know, m meteors coming from the heaven, um, and 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 the the you know feathers. Uh, the, the sailboat, the sailboat that catches yes. the, the air. Yes, so catching the, the air, so, which sort yeah, of like propels yeah. you forward. It's that forward momentum, that sort yeah. of creativity. Yeah, and it's not necessarily that like there are like these very, very clear roles and this is key to understanding the whole, but I think it's part of what makes this movie just on an aesthetic level, just it's so it's so good to watch. It's, it's so like, like the... You, 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 all the, the fire and the water and 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 the, and the stone and all this, all this texture to it. I remember like these are the symbols that yeah. humanity has projected narratives onto since the dawn of time. So I, I think that the elements themselves being narrativized yeah. in the tower world is very much a historical thing as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I also wanted to like just mention the aesthetic level of this movie because we we are really like uh, theme brained on, on this podcast obviously but i just like one of the things i really really appreciated um just this feeling of of care to it like just in the first half of the movie the um the way like with Mahito walking through this mansion and it just feels so like real and tangible and the wood has this like really dark color and it just sounds exactly like so real when whenever like you just you just, they just walk uh, down the halls yeah there's some fantastic so nice and, foley and, work and, here yeah yeah fantastic sound work and 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 the forest area outside has this like darker green like uh swampy color to it that that is i i feel is very distinctive in uh, in like studio ghibli um and yeah, it, just the all these little, little careful details to the ways that uh, characters move and act, which we have learned to like expect from Studio Ghibli. But it's so it was such a good feeling to sit in a theater and experience that, and like know that that like starting at the start of the movie when you see that big like. Totoro on a blue background and just go <laughs> there's there's more that there's still more of this stuff absolutely it yeah, really no, is something truly special and and on that sort of aesthetic level I, I also have to mention the score uh Joe Hisaishi's score for this film is on another level and also is just so unique in the uh, Miyazaki filmography in terms in terms of like the style of his composition for this movie being so different than that for most other Miyazaki films. Um, yeah, it's super subtle and piano based. Yeah, it's uh, very yeah. subtle. It's sparse. The 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 harmonic textures are um, most of the time not following traditional like Western um, functional harmonic structure, and uh, or or like. And it's very much a far cry from like the big sweeping romantic, you know, uh, orchestral scores of like Ponyo or Howl's Moving Castle. Like this is very much a, it almost minimalist, um, 
Yeah, uh, it adds to this like intimacy of the story, which yeah. which is really like also another like really interesting part is how it, it's part of what makes the like fantasy world, the, the tower world, feel so different. It's it's not um, because it it is like really cool and interesting, but it's not. It's not really doesn't feel grand or like yeah. uh, or nice or somewhere you would like to be in any way. It is very like very dis- distinctively like uh, as we've already talked about all like with with the way the world building works. It's it's so uh, inert and infertile and uh, just a a place that that can't like keep itself together. And oh, and, 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 and adds to this about feeling it, yeah. that that the tower world is like unreal and the real world out, outside is so much more tangible not just with the, like the, the sound but also with the way that the score is all about these like very personal intimate things and not about that like grand uh grand vistas uh i can't believe i didn't just think of this until now voice right back when you're talking about the um the isle of the dead painting and the yeah. that first bit when it comes into the world uh, they many times referenced that like it's sort of a world of the dead, and there's like all these sailing ships reminiscent of Pocaroso, uh, like all these yes. ghost ships. But it, specifically, that like wall and this sort of clear vista sparked exactly remembering the exact description in the final Earthsea book that uh, Le Guin wrote before she died. Uh, the other wind, where it describes the afterlife as nothing grand or looming, it is simply a plain colorless field with like a low stone wall dividing the alive and the dead and you can sometimes almost see over into it into the way the dead are and then the exact imagery is almost exactly how like the, what i imagine reading that is exactly how it is depicted in uh this movie yeah like the, absolutely the very calm serene but also like almost lifeless in, in its beauty definitely Oh, that's really good. I, I'm glad that you you mentioned that because I, I I've read all of the Earthsea cycle, but um, I hadn't thought about that connection until now. The 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 low stone wall separating yeah the the two worlds, uh, the living and the dead. Yeah, I mean well, definitely no. uh, Miyazaki has talked about how much he thinks it. He he he's yeah. talked about his love for Le Guin a lot, but um, and and. Yeah. I also, like, I like that you mentioned like the the scene in Porco Rosso when like he has his like sort of vision when he floats up and he sees all of the planes just floating in the sky and just flying sort of calmly and and in in stasis. Um, and how that's very much like how the the sailboats are like on the edge of the horizon this is all just all mm. the dead souls on the other side and. Um, that's there there's so many um little pieces of other miyazaki films in this movie especially in the tower world um that really i think lend credence to the idea that you know when making this film miyazaki certainly was uh basing the sort the tower world on his own creative output um as a whole, like as a concept, um, and the way that his audience, like audiences interact with those works and the way he sort of sees those works. Um, yeah. uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's yeah, so, that's... there's so many countless things. I, I don't want to get into that one, though. Uh, one, one motif I want to mention because I, I already talked about this like whole elements thing that I noticed. The, the other thing that I made note of having seen it, uh, just, just the one time, was like the, like, like passageways and uh, and and barriers and and like in terms of, there's a lot of, like very deliberately like sh- shown like hallways and doors mm. and windows. Like one of the very first shots in the whole movie, uh, is Mahito looking through a like thick glass window and spotting the fire and uh, and the distance and the and and a lot of the like scenes uh, in, in the movie have to do with like uh, the heron outside his like bedroom window uh, looking down the stairs uh, is um, like wait, waiting for his father to come home and later like running down the stairs and as I mentioned before like the um, the tower world is also filled with 
these liminal spaces of like huge like staircases you have to move up and uh, and 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 a maze to move through uh and and the like doors obviously like the big whole like hotel hallway filled with doors to exit the tower world that you have to like hold on to otherwise it goes invisible um it's uh, i'm not sure if i have like a thematic read on it it's just part of the like the like visual like texture of the movie a lot, lot of doors and windows yeah good point it's almost like we're looking through a window when we're sitting in a theater looking at the screen a very like that, that's an easy one a very transient that's always the case <laughs> and temporary window for the blu-ray does not yet exist <laughs> yes <laughs> Um, with which that, I'm actually true. trying to uh, get to the point where we kind of uh, maybe wrap up the first impressions episode. I think we covered a lot of scenes actually in quite a lot of detail. So unless any of you have some final big thoughts to get out, I would actually just use this as an opportunity to tease an even more in-depth and even more close reading approach to the movie once we actually get to enjoy it at home and uh, read what other people thought about it. Um, I have one more thing. I said it before and maybe when we do the full episode i can try to elaborate on more with more thought but it's just the reason i think that the um him hurting himself with the rock is such a pivotal scene in the movie is that of course it like is a manifestation of all of his sort of malice and his um his aggression towards the world but also it's him wanting to be you know seen almost like like commonly self-harm is a is a cry for help for many people so like it it shows his dual sort of nature of of wanting to uh, like feel this anger and aggression, but then also be taken care of, like mm. where he wants the attention from his family. But I thought it was very uh, interesting. I didn't notice until the second time around again. Uh, he gets like a rock, and it like he, he, it's covered in his blood, and then the grand uncle. Maybe there's just a quirk of the translation, and isn't actually how it's meant to be interpreted. But he says. Uh, the rock is sort of connected to his bloodline. Like, this is also almost this, like, weird blood magic with this gigant rock that the granduncle made. So in the weird, again, convoluted time space, it's almost like the the boy may, using this rock to hurt himself almost made this pact with it, where he's, like, allowing his uh, malice and his sort of um, repression of this guilt to, like, physically exist, and he's allowing it to take control of him and harm him. Uh, and that's sort of like uh, when he can finally get over that and accepts it and admits that he harmed himself, does the place come crumbling down? Does the rock no longer have any power in both the tower space and in the real world? Well, uh, I, I'm not that's sure. What I when, yeah, I, I would have to think about that more. But I do think that the idea that this stone being the... the I, I do like the parallel you're drawing there because I do think that in a way the stone for the grand uncle, the floating one that he says gives him his power is kind of like, does also represent this repressed emotion that is, that for the grand uncle is not being directed toward himself, but being uh, put forward as in, in the creation of his world, right? So there is this repressed emotion um, that that is trying to find an outlet. And I think maybe that that stone is what uh, like signifies that yeah it's just like i said the heron only starts talking after he hurts himself so the way i just interpreted it is the him hitting himself with the rock is the threshold he crosses in order to go on this journey to then finally accept the the guilt it's like the lowest point he sort of reaches i mean to be fair it, that's it, true it, it is uh, the threshold in the way that the, the hitting yourself with the rock is both like self-harm as in like a form of escapism. I don't have, want to go to school. I just want to be lay in bed and be cared for. But it's also suicidal yeah. imagery. So escape yes. from life. So it is like perfectly in, in encapsulation of all the reasons why one might disappear into the tower. Yeah, yes. yeah. And, and, it, and it connects with voices reading of um, the stepmother wishing for death yeah. and that's why she ends up in the tower as well that's yeah. probably what it is I mean all the characters also warn him don't get don't play with the tower uh, don't 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 go there it's it's like a cursed place whatever like something like this so they're all saying don't go to this bad place we kind of know what it does just you shouldn't go to the bad place <laughs> and mm. he still does it's like yeah well, he goes and he comes back and he brings back Natsuko. So, 
And he as, as and a rock. Yes. I mean, in that <laughs> sense, the entire structure of friends. the movie is something like he goes there and returns a better person. So we kind of take this approach of, of course, we try to sh shelter people from going through grief, harm, pain, and so on. But all these tough things are also things that help them learn things about life, appreciate life a lot more. And old people, the old ladies with their experience, they already kind of know this, so they can easily warn him of the, of, of the place, right? But yeah. he still has to go through it. You cannot protect the young generation yeah. from any harm or grief, especially when yeah, it comes to learning some, how to live. So, yeah, some, sometimes you really you do need a like weirdo heron wizard, complete goblin mode to like taunt you uh, to get you like out of your like out of your funk. Some people pay good <laughs> money for that. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think it's like it sounds like we're wrapping up here. And the like, film itself the gets yeah. gets you out of your funk. I think that yeah, yeah. that's the point, right? That's that's the <laughs> hopefully the point. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I remember with the wind rises, feeling like such a good closing film for an artist like Hayao Miyazaki. Um, it was a, like a departure in many ways, but it, it also has this. Um, this grand sense of resignation and uh, and finality and reflection, um, and there was this strange feeling when like you learn that like oh he's making another one, uh, and it's called How Do You Live? Uh, that okay well, I guess he's gonna try to like close out on a big finale once more, um, and yeah I, we we all know that he's gone to like retirement like five times since the nineties but. It, it felt much more final the last time around. So there's still this strange feeling of, of going in and seeing a new Miyazaki movie in the year of our law, 2023 or 2024, if uh, you're a less lucky European. Um, and I, but I still think that this is like prob maybe just as good as a, a swan song for, for Miyazaki where, yeah. um, where the wind rises was so much like a reflection about the like the life of an artist and uh, and his relationship to the uh, changing world around him and and this, the sacrifice it takes to be like a uh, a true craftsman. Um, the this movie, the boy and the heron, uh, is much is more deeply about the art. And, and, and the life of that art and the art's um, relationship to the real world. And yeah. I and to can the people imagine, that it reaches. Yeah, yeah, to the people that it reaches, but also to, it It just feels so much, and maybe this is just because we've spent like countless hours like delving into this particular artist and his particular art, but you can, you can sort of feel um, Hayao Miyazaki, this old man, like, in this like sense of like, okay, now I'm finally retired and having this time to reflect about what it all like, add, not just what's like a life of art adds up to, but what having this in the world, having like given this and, and it being received by so many people and how that relates to the lives that people lead. Because like, I, there's, there are probably few living artists who have uh, like so directly uh, touched so many uh, lives, young and old, than other than Miyazaki. And I think there's something very, very poignant and uh, like a, a little sad and like definitely a very melancholic about this movie's message yeah. about like if you ask Miyazaki, the best thing to do with it is not to not to get stuck in it, not to endlessly attempt to revive it, uh, endlessly attempt to recreate or, uh, or s like stay in that fantasy. But it's as as the weirdo Heron says, you know, it's, sometimes it's it's best to forget and uh, and take from it what uh, what's valuable. Well, remarkable closing words. Well. With this, I think we finally caught up again with every 
movie made by Studio Ghibli. We'll see if Miyazaki foils us once again and uh, this doesn't turn out to be his last movie and he actually manages <laughs> to pull off another one, The Madman. Or if, uh, I don't know, Goro returns for something else. Or maybe some new blood. Who knows what Studio Ghibli is going to get up to in the next years. But as it stands now, uh, we will be getting back to the uh, history of Studio Ghibli that we promised last time and actually didn't deliver on. That uh, We took a very long break after our horrors cast, but we're still on that. We're still looking to do Ka Panda Ko Panda uh, for the next episode. And uh, in the timeline... For the future of the Nausicaas, there's also a spot for, as we mentioned in the beginning of this podcast, for another take on The Boy and the Heron, when the movie has had a lot more time to sit, to become, I, I suppose, a historical artifact of anime history, to become discussed yes. in journals so that we know its impact, that we know what Miyazaki said in interviews years of, or, or a year or something after the creation. There's no promises yet as to when this episode will be, but it will be one co uh, covering the movie in the same thorough style that you've gotten used to for all the other Studio Ghibli movies. Even though you had a little taste of this uh, here, it actually didn't expect us to go quite that into depth, but I'm very happy that we did because <laughs> I think... Yeah, but uh, uh, but we, still, uh, we still need people smarter than us to, uh, to write about it so we can, uh, we can copy their work. Right? Exactly. And we also need more interviews, more <laughs> translations of interviews, more documentaries, everything. All of the stuff. Yeah. I, I believe there's quite some material that is Japanese only currently and not yet translated. Stuff that we can hopefully also have a look at when that is all released finally. And with that, I would like to say uh, to everyone listening to us, um, thanks for listening to the cast. I hope you consider supporting us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash double, double A. Um, and uh, you can join our Discord community. There's quite some uh, uh, exchanges, discussions there frequently. You can join in, jump in, talk to us about our takes on uh, uh, The Boy and the Heron, add your own theories to the mix. And then... Aside from that, see you all in the next episode, this time actually on Panda Ko Panda, and hopefully not that long a break again. Goodbye, everybody. Yeah, Bye. Keep, uh, keep Bye. some rocks in your pockets, folks. Bye. <laughs>